The following program was produced by an independent community producer. The opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of the ECAT staff or board of directors. Welcome to Well Informed. Well Informed is an affiliate of the Retirement Education Center of North America. The Retirement Education Center of North America is intended to be an educational awareness organization. We do not advise, market, or refer services. The content and discussion presented in this program are for broad informational purposes only and are not to be replaced, used, or misconstrued as professional advice. Please consult your advisor for information pertaining to your personal, individual situation. My name is Mark Cardozer and I'm your host. Today's episode is one of three series, estate planning, tax planning, and income planning. Top, today's topic is estate planning. My guests are estate planning and elder law, Lawrence Saharoff, college professor, attorney, and CPA, Timothy A. Gagnon, and founder and senior managing director of Heritage Wealth Management, Vince Serratori. Welcome, gentlemen. Let's get started. Okay. Great. First, what is an estate plan and why should one have one? Uh, <clears throat> an estate plan is a thought out process of where your assets should go when you pass away. Um, during lifetime, you also have, an, you should have an estate plan that dictates where your assets go. If you're under a disability, prior to death. What's the process of organizing an estate plan? The process simply is to sit down with professionals, ask, tell them what your assets are, and hopefully in conjunction with the team, they will come up with a, an estate plan that fits your particular needs. Okay. When I was a kid, my parents had a last will and testament. I was a kid. It was back in the 19, God only knows, so 1960s and 70s. What to do when they're dead and who gets the kids. That's it. That's it. And it doesn't take effect till they're dead. It's so a, will no speaks, a will speaks at death. That's the only time it speaks. That's it. Correct. Correct. And then later on, they came in with a bunch of blue-backed documents. This is a different, is this an estate plan on its own? That is a very simple, basic estate plan. If you don't have that, Massachusetts statutes have an estate plan for you. And but it may not do what you want. And it, with just the last will and testament, it can take upwards of a year to a year and a half before your assets are allowed to go where they should go. Because? Because you have to petition the probate court and uh, have it a personal representative appointed to marshal the assets of the estate. Then when they're appointed, which can be 30, 60, or 90 days later, depending upon the court, um, they will then administer the estate, your assets, according to the last will and testament. So I have a house. Key point, though, mm -hmm. it only takes on your dead. If you get disabled, it does nothing. Cannot do anything if you need help while you're living. You've okay. got to be dead and buried. I have to be dead and buried. So I have a house in here. That house, I can't do anything with until you get an appointment. it goes through... Until you get the probate court to appoint a representative. Okay. Because until then, there's nobody who has the legal authority to, to sell the that. house. Someone told me that this also could be found at the probate court and they Absolutely. get copies it's a of it. It's a public document. So it's not pri there's nothing private about nothing this. Nothing private. You can sit at home on Friday night, surf the web, and read everybody's will about in your neighborhood. And in that dead. will, after they filed it, has inventory of assets? There's an inventory, you, there's an accounting. It, Yearly accounting, and the inventory lists all the assets that was in the deceased person's name only. Okay. Thank you. So that 
kind of clarifies what we have as a last will and testament. You know, I, I had a question Vincent, on, on last will and testament. So with this all being available for everyone to see, can anybody contest a will? Gentlemen? Since it's, it's available for the public and everyone to see what you have, can anyone say that that person owed me money? Can it that be contested? That would be contesting a will. That would That's, be lien against I'll the lien. Okay. file in. Contestants you're filing just since you're a saying claim. the will is not proper. Okay. They didn't sign it, they do it. Usually that's family that and would and, contest. And, and that particular will was done under undue influence or the person wasn't in their right mind at the time and they omitted someone, a family member, or they omitted a group of people that normally would have received the assets uh, from the deceased person. So then if I had a will, and I went to a family and said, your parents owe me money. That's right. So they have to make a, the probate. They have to file a claim at the probate court. And then what happens there? Then they have to perfect that claim by filing a, the lawsuit. And the personal representative has the ability to reject Rejected. the claim to make them come forth and prove it. Or can accept it and just pay it. Do you find that that happens at all? Yes. Credit card companies are the first ones to file the day after someone's death. They have a service who's looking in the obituaries mm -hmm. constantly looking for their credit card holders so they can file in. So isn't it also true that when you file for probate, you also have to put it into local newspapers? Yeah, there's a publication requirement. It's publication a publication notice. requirement. So the not only out, not only are lien holders looking through files, of obituaries, but they're also looking through the Boston Globe or any other newspapers that you're required to file this under. And you have to send notice to everybody who was an heir, direct heir, or named in the will. You have to send them a notice to tell that, them that, that they're the, in it. That the person has passed away, that that person has an estate, you give them the uh, docket number, um, and it's easy for them to look up wow. what the assets are. So no privacy, and it has to be probated, and it could take time to process. Oh, yeah. Time, delay, and expense. So if I have a house that's in this last will and testament, it has to go through the probate process, which could be up to a year. I have to maintain the house. I have to make sure it's kept up and everything else. So that I have to have it insured. But you also don't have access to the decedent's assets to fund it. You're going to have to fund it separately and get reimbursed later. Well, sounds like a, a lot of work. So then later on, a few years later, they came back, my parents came back with a bunch of blue backed documents. And among them was a power of attorney. Only you, valid while you're alive. Only mm -hmm. valid while I'm alive. It, the power of attorney dies when you die. The power of attorney allows a family member, a trusted friend, a fiduciary, someone who you trust, um, uh, to sign your name. To do financial matters. While I'm alive. While you're alive. While you're under a disability, while you're alive. Okay. And the disability doesn't have to be a physical or a mental disability. It can be, I'm in Hawaii, and someone has to be at the courthouse to sign a, a document. You've appointed someone that can actually sign your name. Okay. So what takes over once I've passed away? Well, either the last will and testament or revocable trust or an irrevocable trust. It depends on where your assets okay. reside. So let's talk about the revocable trust. You by another name. Me by another name. It's an alias. Okay. It's a, it's, it's, it's a document that you control. It's amendable, it's changeable, and it can manage your assets. You uh, normally appoint yourself and or a spouse as the trustee to handle all of the matters. Can I change this whenever I want? It's and amendable and changeable. It doesn't file its own tax return. What if I move out of state? It's still valid okay. under Massachusetts law. So that means the out-of-state court has to look at mass law as how they would administer it. 
But we always recommend go see a local attorney in your new jurisdiction, your new state. So how does this relate to, you mentioned that um, you either go to a revocable trust or a last will and testament, but yet the comprehensive program package that my parents came home with had a revocable trust and also had this in it as well. Why? For anything that didn't get retitled into the trust, it's gonna go through the will. I like to give the example. I had a client. Um, we didn't have to probate the last will and testament. Everything was in the revocable trust. We had retitled all of their assets into the revocable trust after they signed the paperwork. The gentleman passed away. Six months after he passed away, we're going on with life. And the widow calls me up and says, I got a $75,000 check from a long lost cousin out of Ogden, Utah. And the check came from a law firm made payable in the name of my husband. What should I do? I called the law firm in Utah and asked them to reissue the check in the name of the revocable trust they said it was against Utah law. We then had to probate the will in order to deposit into an estate account the $75,000 check. And then immediately, because it, there was a pour over provision in the last will and testament, it poured over to the revocable trust and then we were able to close the estate uh, almost immediately. So these two under certain circumstances work together. They can work together, yes. You need both. You need both. You can't fish one, you need both. Awesome. So if I forget to put something in my revocable trust, the last will and testament is like a bridge to get me to my revocable it's trust? A, it's a safety in? net, yes. I've had more Christmas clubs go through the last will and testament. Yeah. Because they forgot about them to get them into the trust because otherwise we couldn't get to them. Sure. Right. <laughs> I had a. Um, family member that passed away and his truck was left outside and it would we probated it and it went back through so it, it's a good tool to have this in the, so this is more of a comprehensive estate plan well it, it comes in two different parts because the revocable trust also means you could have named a trustee while you were living to administer the assets instead of having to do just the power of attorney they could administer the trust while you're still alive prior to death so that you can get somebody else to help do things should you be disabled okay. in some way. So this alone, the living, the last will and testament alone only satisfies when I'm dead. These revocable trust, work power of attorney, life. work while I'm alive, along and with- after you're, And after I'm dead. The re well, yes. revocable, it does after the, the revocable trust will continue on after you've passed away. And then they came home with a living will and healthcare proxy. What does this do for us? Your living will is your public declaration of how you want, um, the, whether or not you want the plug to be pulled or you want heroic measures to but be performed. But in Massachusetts, it's directional only. It cannot it's a be wish. enforced. It's, it's a wish. But you're, a lot, you're letting your healthcare agent who you've appointed with a healthcare proxy, know that if you're on life support, you, you want the plug to be pulled, or you want to continue on life support, and maybe they'll come up with a miracle cure in six months or a year. Now, there are cases I've heard of that parents were and uh, husband were against each other pulling a plug um, on somebody that was laying in a bed and just existing. Would this document help in that situation? That's two documents. The healthcare proxy allows the agent that you've appointed to make the decision. Your living will, you're telling your healthcare agent, this is what I would want. But they're not bound to it. But they're not bound to it. Okay. So I, I go so to. So ultimately, the spouse in the normal case, is going to make the decision. They can give consent or, 
withhold consent on an operation, on pulling the plug or not pulling the plug. So I go to the doctor. And the doctor says to me, do you have a healthcare proxy on file? And I go, huh, don't know. So they, said, they hand me this form. And I don't have a copy with me. It's statutory. It's, it's a Massachusetts it's healthcare it's form. What is different between that form and this document? Well, a Massachusetts healthcare proxy by the institutions don't travel that well. Other jurisdictions may not agree with it. With the healthcare proxy that we put together, it travels throughout all the 50 states. So if I'm in California, yes, and I something happens to me, I get hit by a bus. Yeah. My healthcare proxy, my Massachusetts healthcare proxy is in question. Whereas this one more likely will be uh, covered. That one tends to have more details. Okay. The Massachusetts statutory one is basically who are the two people and that's it. Yeah. Awesome. Where that one Not necessarily to witnessed. Not notarized, yeah. Okay. And, and a lot of times it's while that person is lying in bed okay. who may not have chosen those people. Gotcha. Or cognizant as to what they did. Yeah. So another thing in their pile of blue backings was irrevocable trusts. And they had one that was a real estate trust, irrevocable, um, a real estate trust. And in doing my homework and researching it a little more, I looked at real estate trusts and I said, ah, there's a revocable trust and an irrevocable trust. And then there's this thing, which isn't a trust, but it's called the life estate. So can you tell me what the revocable real estate trust is going to do for us? It will have within the trust an orderly disposition of your real estate. Again, it's revocable. You can change it while you're alive. If it's irrevocable, you cannot change the terms of the trust. Is there anything you can change in that trust? In an irrevocable trust, you can change the situs of the trust, administrative provisions, that's allowed. Okay. But the substantive provisions are not allowed to be changed. So what are substantive provisions? Who, who what, where, who, and when they get the money. Who, when they get what, the asset. where, and when they get the money. Who, the beneficiaries. Yeah. What, the amount of money that's in there. Where. Where. When is, is when. But, but where could be that they have to, or clarify differently, is there a certain age, is there a certain position, where, where are they going to get the money? What point do they qualify for? So it could and actually what it's for. So it could protect, beneficiary. It could protect one of my beneficiaries that may be someone that can't control money. We could we could spend consider thrift. that person to be a spendthrift, mm -hmm. and you want to protect them for as long as possible. And how would that happen? Would someone would would these have trustees? I would go. The trustee would go to Vincent and say, I need income for the next 20 years for this portion, for that spendthrift person. And then the principal can come out at whatever number that happens to be, and it can be handed over to the spendthrift. You've determined that the age of 60, the spendthrift can have all the money that they need. Or the spendthrift's heirs. Okay. This could go, as long as they're alive, and then go to their children, grandchildren, as opposed to coming out to the spender. Okay. You put the rules. How does an irrevocable trust impact my capital gains or my estate tax? Well, if you've put things into an irrevocable trust, it's a gift. So you've used up your gift tax credit. But at your death, it's out of your estate, so we don't end up having to pay a state tax on it. But the cap gain, when you put an item into an irrevocable trust, you put it in at the basis you have at the time. So you may be 
if you leave it in there for 20 years, you may have a large cap gain sitting there, mm -hmm. as opposed to, let's say, the revocable, I put it in there, and I die, and now it goes irrevocable, I get a step up to the fair market value date of death, so I get rid of all that cap gain. Well, I appreciate but the cap gain tax is the same in okay. inside or outside. I appreciate all that detailed information. The answer directly is there is some tax benefits to putting money into an irrevocable, to putting a home into an irrevocable trust. Depending on the client. Depending on the client. Okay. So back to at the very beginning, we discussed everything needs to be, everything is situational to the individual, and that's why this conversation here is for general purposes. But but that's why you also need a team of individuals because you need, no offense to the lawyers, but they're not always tax sensitive where the accountant tends to be tax sensitive, but not form and, and, and document sensitive. And I started off my conversation at the beginning by saying the client comes in and we sit down with all the professionals, the team members. So you get every perspective and then the client can make a determination what we think is in their best interest, and we create the foundation, which is the documents. At that, after the documents are signed, then we instruct them on how to fund the, the foundational documents. And the team could be as simple as two or three people, depending on the size of the estate, to many professionals. Depends on what you've got. Depends on what you have. It's situational. Need people knowledgeable about what you have. Mm -hmm. Better advice because they know what it is and how it works. I mean, if you want to fund your trust, Vincent's an expert at it because he's done so many of them. <laughs> but you got to know what the paperwork is and how to get it done and, you know, what the process. But also, once you reach that point, you're starting now to look for advice. When you want to do things, well, what's the right way to do it? When do I do it? How do I do it? So you're taking these documents and... They don't just go into the closet. They're, they're living documents that you're going to use over time because you may be moving things in and out. You may be want to shift. You may change what you're going to do. And then I'm going to have to sooner or later get to that life estate you put on there that yeah. is not a trust. So that's the next topic. A, a life estate isn't a trust. What is it? A, a life estate is uh, a deed where you have two components. You have the, uh, the life estate holder, which is usually the older generation, and then you have the remainder men, and the remainder men are usually your children, so that the life estate avoids probate because you've already ha you already have the house in the name of the children. You've already All said who's going to get it when I'm dead. That's okay. correct. What is it protecting? Um, not a state tax. What isn't it protecting? It's not protecting. It's There's no the creditor tax. protection for the remainder men. No creditor protection. So for, if, for the remainder if, men. If somebody's coming for, for the remainder men. So in other words, if I'm the um, front line, yeah. the remainder men is the second line. So there's no protection on creditors. Whereas, or divorce. Or divorce. Or lawsuits? No. No. There's no, no it's protection. It's an open asset. It's an open asset. So who do you find is appropriate for a life estate and why? I have done very few life estates because I just don't think that they fit in the majority of the people that walk into They're very our popular in Florida. Florida. Why? They're called a ladybird. Yeah, I've heard of those. Yeah. Why? Why are they so popular? Simplest way to move the asset to keep it out of Medicaid. It stays away from Medicaid. Yeah. No. Let's Not make in it Massachusetts. Clear. Not in Massachusetts. Not in, in Massachusetts. In Florida, it does. Many people get confused with Medicare and Medicaid. What is Medicare is a health insurance Down program, Social federal Security. Me Social Security. Medicaid. Medicaid is a state you're asking, federal program. Go you're for asking. It the state of Massachusetts to fund someone's long-term care at a nursing home facility. Because they ran out of money. Because they, ran, they do not have enough money or assets. The life estate actually for the elder person is a countable asset. 
it has value. And Mass Health can ask you to sell the life estate. Who's going to buy the life estate? I don't know. Or you have to have a penalty period for the value of the life estate. That penalty period means you have to find another way to fund the nursing home. Interesting. Care. So it's. And there's no selling of the house for the life estate, and there's no mortgage for the life estate. You need the remainder men and the life estate holder to agree to sell the house or to um, mortgage the property. Okay, let's discuss estate tax in Massachusetts and the life estate. The estate tax in Massachusetts is a million dollars? No, the trigger is a million dollars, then all the estate is taxable. Okay. Once you pass assets equal to a million. From dollar one. From dollar you one. Trigger so tax. here's the fun part. And this is what really scares me. I have a life estate. I, I opened it five, six, seven years ago. My house valued back then was three, four hundred thousand dollars. Now it's valued nine hundred thousand. And when I add everything up, up after that, I'm up over a million. How is my life estate handling that? It's not doing anything on that. What happens? Fair market value of the property is includable in your estate. Keep in mind that there's a step up there for the kids. There's no minimization of the estate tax. Okay, so we're going to ignore. There's a step up. It's great for the kids, but for your estate tax purposes, full value date of death is included in your estate, which could trigger mass so estate So now tax. My, ho my, my house and my assets are up over a million bucks, and the real estate helped that jump it up. What do I do with my life estate? What do I do? You have no control over it. You put it in, you now can't change it. So I probably have to move it to an irrevocable trust. But you can't move it on your own because the remainder person would have to be part of that irrevocable trust. So my decision six years ago now has consequences as to what I want to do now because the values of everything have gone up. But now I have to go to re the remainder men who are probably my children or my heirs. If I don't have any children, I have nieces and nephews I'm leaving it to. They have to agree with me to do this. To transfer it because so they now, own. So how it. private is that? Well, once you do a deed, there's no privacy. That's on the public record. So I brought my entire family and sublines if Keeping I- Keeping in mind that your entire family may not be at a position at that time to transfer that asset because if they're getting old, they may be looking at Medicare. Now they've given an asset away, five year look back. They may be in the middle of a divorce, which now means this asset is part of the divorce proceeding. You may not be able to do it because divorce Because they own a piece argument. of it. Yes. They own a piece of that they property. They own everything from the day you die forward. And when you die, it merges together. They'll have one interest. But until you die, you're the only one who can live there and you collect the rent on the rent. But you, Take an example, I use it a lot. If you put a new roof on the house, technically you have to pay for the portion that would relate to why you were living there and the remainder people need to pay for the portion of the roof for after your death. So now I've got to allocate the cost of that roof technically between the two because it exceeds your life. Don't you like that one? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, I'm just sitting here thinking about, wait a minute, I have legal fees and accounting fees to pay for too. Well, of course. <laughs> okay. But but that's like we when I've seen them used, typically they've been low asset people who want to get it out from a Medicaid standpoint, and they would like to die owning it because their kids would like to get rid of all that gain that occurred while mom lived in the house when she bought the house for nineteen thousand and it's now worth a million dollars. All that gain is forgiven if she dies owning it from estate tax. But that comes with a lot of situations through right. time with her. But we just saw the real estate market go up, what, Vincent, 42%, 50%? The, since the beginning of COVID. Yeah. yeah. What's it gone up? It's up over 30%, 30. depending on the community that you live in. Right. So if I'm living in a robust community, my life estate's up there and I need to revisit it. It's not a, 
easier to not visit, easy as you visit as I think. It's not a coming to the office, to my attorney's office and saying, here's what's going on. I have to bring everyone that's listed as a remainder mint. Everybody who's on the deed. Right. Everyone that's on the deed. <laughs> because the life estate is created on the deed. Now, if I am on the deed and I want to go buy something, can I use that as leverage to purchase a second home? It's an asset, yes. It's my asset as well as, so if I have the but primary- only the value of the remainder interest at that point is an asset that you could use to pledge. So I can use that to leverage a piece of yeah. property or something I want to purchase. But it could be if, considered you know, you know, if, collateral. If, collateral. If you, a bank would go for it, would allow it through right. underwriting because yeah. there's but no you, control over it. Mm -hmm. if, if your new venture does not go according to plan and your, the bank has to foreclose on that new house or new investment and go after the asset that's, that I own as a remainderman, they're not gonna get to that asset as the remainderman. They've gotta sit there and wait for the life estate Say, person to die. To die. So I uh, very rarely have I ever seen a bank allow that to be collateralized. I've seen very few life estate only be sold. Yeah. Because you're buying it and you only have control of the house till the person dies. You don't yeah. extend it. So suddenly grandma was 90 and you buy it and she lives to 92. You owned it for two years. You're done. The house is now out, belongs to the remainder and you have no interest. It's totally based off the life of the life estate person. It's totally off their life. You can't change the life. Well, I think we've we've killed it. Put that <laughs> we've, we've we've put the subject of revocable, irrevocable, and not a trust is a life estate. I think we've pretty much put that in the grave. <laughs> so that's but, but that's why it's very important to meet with a state planning attorney and a team to understand all the concepts and ramifications around doing these surveillance. Because you see them quite often in the press, but understanding what it means and to your situation, what it will mean is, is critical. Awesome. So I just want to go, I don't want to go deep into, I want to go deep into that area because that's important. Real estate is usually a considerable portion of a person's entire asset portfolio. Um, but I do want to just briefly mention irrevocable property interest trusts, irrevocable retirement trusts, special needs trusts, um, and also a life insurance trust. So, so when, a, when, a, when a client comes to a- All with different purposes. They're, those are very special purpose trusts. Special Going needs specific. trust is, if you have a family member that it has special needs, they have a mental disability, they have a physical disability, and you wanna protect them by having assets available that can pay for benefits for that disabled person that the government doesn't pay for. You don't wanna interfere with government benefits. And that's the purpose of the special needs trust. Awesome. Larry, you, earlier you mentioned a spendthrift. Yeah. What, how does this estate plan handle if I have a person in my family that is a spendthrift. If you have told me in client interviews that you have a, a spouse or a child that if you give them a dollar, they will spend $2. That's someone that you have to make sure that when they get money, when you've passed away, whatever is given to them, it's protected. So we'll have a trustee over the portion that they would get. And um, in the trust, the terms might be that they get income only for 10 years. So assuming a 10% return on a million, on a million dollars, that's 100,000. They should be able to live on 100,000. But the million dollars doesn't get touched. That's the principle. You say that after 10 years, they can get 25% of the principal. And then 10 years later, they can get another 25%.
And during those 10 year intervals, they're still getting interest from the, whatever the investment advisor has accumulated through the income and dividends. You determine the rules for when distributions occur, hmm. when they get money, how they get the money, if they get the money. And sometimes um, you will say this money can only be used for housing costs. College costs. College. Weddings. Or, or the purchase of a certified pre-owned car every three or four years. You can dictate those terms. The same rules you were to live by while you were alive and if you're still alive can be in the trust to maintain that same system, rhythm. Yeah. Good way to put it. I think a simple way is just to let clients know that it's a way to control through the grave so that the assets can be there for the children for a long period of time. Do you see a lot of this? Uh, more and more every year. It's definitely been more popular in the last 10 years. Well, I think our society is getting wealthier. And with that comes more trust and more dictate, dictation of where this money has to go and protection of uh, people that may be a spendthrift or get in trouble with having too much money. But Thank not even necessarily for spendthrifts, what we also see is that a lot of parents that grew up in a time where there were pensions and they had more resources in retirement, they're finding that their children no longer have the ability to have a pension, or maybe they're not saving enough for retirement. So what's happening is, is that cost of housing being so high that parents are looking to earmark the inheritances over a period of time so they'll have money when they're older as well. So anyone can craft it any way that they want, but folks are getting a lot more creative, and they can do whatever really that they want, as they mentioned before. I look at a lot of beneficiaries when somebody dies, are like the lottery winners, like a deer in the headlights. Mm -hmm. Suddenly they get this huge yeah. amount of money, they don't mm -hmm. know how to manage it, so they spend the principal, which means they mm -hmm. run out of money. Like most lottery winners don't have the money 10 years later because they don't have the manager. So what the parents are trying to do is put the management in place so it doesn't go you know, for pizzas and Harleys tour in Europe in that it's put to good uses, to the proper use, to the proper time, and allowing them to learn about money and how to do it. because. Um, a lot of the younger kids are not as financial aware as they may have been in the past because, I mean, when you were getting 25 cents a week for your allowance, you were pretty good at spreading it out. Suddenly, and many of them, I mean, many of the younger kids now, they don't have checkbooks. They never mm -hmm. balance their checking account. Everything's on a debit card, so they never know what their bank balance is, which means if they had a big bank balance, they could spend it all out and not realize it. So trying to put in the rules to try to help them learn. And that's what the trust tends to do. Awesome, that's helpful, that's necessary. One last irrevocable trust I wanna talk about, I think it's important, is the irrevocable life insurance trust. Now, when um, an individual has a large life insurance, they might wanna put it into a trust to keep it away from the assets, estate. The, the estate, estate. <laughs> and Medicaid, the estate mass health, Medicaid. Yeah, it outlows all that. So when they do that, being on the insurance side of things, there's a thing called the Goodman Triangle, which creates a tax issue if the insurance policy isn't positioned correctly. So the Goodman Triangle says that you can't have the beneficiary, the insured, and the owner to be different. Two of them have to be the same. Now the insured is the insured. So therefore it leaves the owner and the beneficiary to be the same. And it has to be the trust in mm -hmm. order for that to take place, which makes sense. Because that's something that I think people need to be aware of. The other thing that I think is important when you're dealing with a life insurance, an irrevocable life insurance trust, if you're just purchasing the insurance, it's always better to purchase it and put the insurance policy in the trust initially upon issue. Why is well, that, Larry? The, Why trust is that, should, the trust should buy the policy. Trust so there's no look back period. You save a three year look back. So if you transfer a life insurance policy that you've had into the irrevocable life insurance trust and you pass away within three years, there's a look back 
and it goes back into your estate for estate tax purposes. So by doing it out of the gate and the, the trust purchasing the insurance, it, it takes the look back period from five years to well, three. From three years. From three to years to three no years look back. Three years to zero. If the trust buys the policy directly, there's no look back period. No look back period. If you own it and transfer it in, I don't care if you only owned it for a day, it's a three year look back period. Mm -hmm. So what we typically tell a client to do is go to the insurance agent, get rated, find out what the policy is going to be, what the premium is going to be. If you like it, then we will have them cancel that application and the trust will do it because now we know what the policy mm -hmm. is going to be. We know what the premium is going to be. They know they can do it. And we've just eliminated or bypassed the, the three period. I've got rid of the three year period because the trust bought the policy. Wonderful. Thanks. So the check for the first premium is made from the trust. Yep. Excellent. Excellent. Gentlemen, thanks for that information. Vincent, how does all this trust work work in, in the side of investment, the investment aspect? Well, I think after the trusts are actually created, now I think the hard part comes in is, well, what do you do with it? <laughs> and what we find is that unless you put your assets into the trust, really, they won't follow the trust. And by that, what we mean is you have to actually change the accounts. They have to be in the name of the trust. So it follows the rules of the trust and follows whatever the beneficiary schedule is. Very simple process. It can be done at a bank. Any investment institution can do it as well. But the process needs to be done where normally a copy of the trust goes to the institution with all brand new paperwork. And when you get your new statements in the mail, it'll have the name of the trust. You still have control based on the trust, but that is a process that needs to be done. Because if not, then your trust is really worthless because there's nothing in it. So if I have my trust signed today, we have a signing ceremony, I have my trust, I go home with them. A year later, I decide to fund them to move my assets into the trust. And then I have Medicaid trusts in here. When does the look back period start? Is it starting upon the date that I signed the trust or is it starting on the date that I funded the trust? Um, it starts the day that you gifted the money into the trust. So if you signed it on January 1st of 2023 and funded on January 1st of 2024, January 1st, 2024 begins the five year mm -hmm. look back period for the amount of money that you put into the trust. And any subsequent contribution start a new five-year period on that contribution. So we try to convince the clients that they should be putting in uh, more than uh, just a small amount, um, not a thousand dollars on a monthly basis, but maybe put in fifty thousand the first day or a, a larger number, because. You're trying to protect that money, and the day that you put that big check in to fund the trust starts the five-year look-back period. And normally, it's a five-year look-back period. From Mass Health, from Medicaid, Mass Health. yes. Okay, so I've gone ahead and I funded all my policies, I uh, funded all my trusts, and I get to sit back. I enjoy life. I go on. How often do I have to revise them? My suggestion has always been when you have a life-changing event or three to five years, and the three to five years is because there could be changes in the tax laws or in the uh, judge's decisions, appellate court decisions that interpret certain clauses a way that you didn't think were gonna be interpreted, so that you wanna make those changes within the documents to conform to the new law. The other things being, maybe the kids have changed in three to five years, so maybe you did want different rules with them. Maybe the fiduciaries you've been aren't alive anymore. <laughs> or your kids no longer are under a guardian, they're, under eight, they're over 18, so you don't need a guardian in your will. So a lot of times, it's, it, it's and it doesn't guarantee every three to five years that you're going to change it. It's relook at it to make sure it still meets what you want it. That doesn't mean we're automatically going to change everything and rewrite it. No, it's just making sure it's still doing what you want the way you want. Awesome. 
Well, I think we've given the viewers a good overview of what um, estate planning is all about. Um, just give me your last comments. Larry, give me um, any final comments that you'd like to let the viewers know. I think when you do this as a, in a team approach and you have a multiple you have multiple conversations with the clients, the team is going to come up with the best approach to satisfy your needs and desires. And, and when, I, you, when you say a team, what is a team? The lawyer, the accountant, the investment advisor, the insurance salesperson, the insurance expert, the annuity expert. Um, that's the team that you should be sitting down with. It doesn't have to be all at once, but you should be sitting down so that everybody is talking to each other. Is, it a, is there a benefit to doing it all at once, all together in one room? It, it will streamline the process. Vincent, any last comments? Well, I think to you know follow Larry's lead, I think it's important as well why everyone should be together because it's a great checks and balances gives an opportunity for multiple professionals to be looking at all of your affairs and look at where we are today and where we need to be in the future. And with so many changes that are going on legally, we believe that having your legal house in order is imperative in this day and age. So they're not, not spending unnecessary dollars on probate costs and other issues that come down the road. So uh, if you've amassed a bit of wealth or trying to protect it against creditors or you know, probate and estate taxes is important to get your legal house in order. Tim. Sort of expanding upon what Vincent and Larry said, each of the people in the team have a certain area that they concentrate in. And you need all of their expertise because there's nobody I know anymore who knows everything. There's no general practitioner because there's so many, so much complexity mm -hmm. out there that you need people who are do that area. And if you get them all together at one time, they so it evinces their check and balance on that. When they hear something, they say, now, wait a minute, that's going to have this effect so that you can get a better. If you try to do it piecemeal, you're going to get a lot of discussion, but the other one doesn't know what they said. So suddenly it may not be in congruity as to exactly what the answer is. It's going to have different pieces because they're each going to answer it from their point of view. We like to sort of beat each other up on the points of views to say, hey, wait a minute, I see that, but <laughs> what about if you do this, it's going to cause that. Oh, okay, now we make a better plan. And the whole idea is to get the best plan that works for you the way you want. But I can only do that if we all know what each other's doing. And that benefits the client. 100%. We're all working for the client only, not for ourselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's what's best for them. But figuring that also takes a little time because nobody's ever walked in and precisely told me what they want. Mm -hmm. And I have to figure it out. Yeah. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for um, discussing this topic with us today. Um, I'd like to thank um, and extend my gratitude to ECAT for allowing us to share this content with their viewers. We hope you found the episode helpful and look forward to other topics. ECAT thrives on sponsorship and one-time or monthly donations. Please donate to ECAT. The Retirement Education Center of North America is offering a copy of Position for Retirement. Thank you for a $20 physical copy for a $20 donation and a digital copy for a $10 donation. Positioning for retirement can also be found on the local office shelf at the Ames Free Library. Thank you for joining us today and please stay safe and well informed. Welcome to Well Informed Behind the Scene. First, I want to thank Larry and Tim and Vincent for doing that episode for us on estate planning. Um, I think they did a great job. But what, one of the things that we do behind the scene is it's, it's just me and you. And I get to talk to you directly and we get to share, I get to share some information that I see along the way with estate planning and the other topics that we touch on. Um, and so I want to point out a couple things. Uh, we went through all these blue backings. Um, sometimes they're not blue backings. Sometimes your attorney might just put them in a, um, 
a binder, but whatever they are, they're an estate plan. We, we went through the comprehensive plan, which is all these, um, and we talk, discussed different elements and programs. Um, so that's important. But what I wanna stress, and I know we talked about it briefly um, during, the, during the show, is it's so important to put these documents in, in place uh, to, to it's, it's like these documents are like, they're just paper. And, but picture them as being a, a safe with a combination. So if you just have the, a safe and you don't put anything in it, then you have an empty safe. If you have documents like your trust, especially your trust, and you don't have, you don't put anything in them by retitling assets, or beneficiaries, then you have just paper. They're worthless. The only two pieces, the only two elements in there that don't need funding is your power of attorney, well, your living will, this three, and the um, last will and testament, okay? Those stand on their own. But the trusts need to be funded. So when we fund them, we go to the bank and the bank wants to see, say it's a revocable trust or an irrevocable trust, they want a copy of it. They usually want the original. They send it to the legal department most of the time. Sometimes they have the authority to review them. And they have it reviewed, and it comes back a few days later or a week later. And then you go and sit down with them, and they retitle the asset to the trust, and they change the beneficiary to the trust. That's important. Same thing with your insurance policies. Call the insurance agent up or go call the insurance company and tell them that you've just developed a trust. Uh, it might be an irrevocable life insurance trust. It might be uh, a revocable trust that you just want to rename the beneficiary. But remember, when you do that, you need to re and it with an insurance policy, you need to rename the owner as well because you don't want to have a Goodman Triangle, which we discussed. So just to review a Goodman Triangle, you need to have the owner and the beneficiary the same. The insured is the insured. You can't have two different, you can't have a different owner than a different beneficiary. It creates a triangle. So you need one, the same. The owner and the beneficiary need to be the same to avoid a tax situation in the event of your death. So you call these people, you put these documents, you give them the documents, they review them, you change the ownership if the attorney recommended you to do that, and you change the beneficiary if you've been told to do that. Now, once when you had the when you got these documents and you had the signing ceremony, they call it, uh, you left with them, and the attorney should have given you a list of to guide you through all of this, of what needs to go where, what you need to do, and how you need to do it. Sometimes it's a lengthy letter and it's it's cumbersome to read, but please read it. Uh, don't be afraid to reach out to your attorney for clarification because it's very important. If something isn't in the right place and isn't properly placed in the trust, it can, you've done trust work for a really no apparent reason. So that's important. The other thing I want to point out, we're coming in, we're, we're in a day, an era where um, trust is an issue and concerns like um, mental capacity is an issue. So a lot of times when people wait to have their documents signed, um, sometimes the, the institution might question the document. I've gotten documents, people have asked me to send them to the insurance company and file them, and they weren't even notarized. So these are the things that are important. So you don't want to be in a situation where you need to get this document to the insurance company so that you can make a change or facilitate something to do with that annuity or life insurance or securities. And then find out when it gets to that receiving company that they're not happy with the document. So always send it to them, make sure they're happy. Do it soon rather than later because then if there's a problem, you can go back to the attorney and you can fix it. We've, we've seen documents that have come back that aren't dated correctly. Uh, these the mistakes happen. 
You hire professionals, they do a great job, you trust them, but they're human and things happen. So it's always better to be ahead of the problem than behind it. So give these documents to your institution sooner rather than later. Let them look at them, let them accept them. If they don't accept them, then you can go back and you can fix them so that they're acceptable. It's great to have an extra eye looking at these things. Um, power of attorneys, great thing to have, very important. But they need to be updated. So don't all your documents every so often need to be updated. A lot of banks won't look at power of attorneys after a certain period of time, or they want to have them recertified, or they want to have them rewritten, um, because they question them. So it's important every three, five, seven years to have your documents looked at. And we, at the Retirement Education Resource Center at ThinkSmarts, um, we have tools for you to help you out. So we have an app coming out, it's called ThinkSmarts. Unique, right? And it's an app that's going to help organize you. It's a cradle to grave app. You can put all your legal documents into it. You can, you can do quick snapshot information, ask for three or four questions. And you can actually upload, you can scan the document into your computer and upload it to your phone. That's how simple it is. So you have all your documents with you at all times. I had a situation where a person's house burnt down and the documents were in the house. Well, and they were in a desk and the desk burnt. So it was worthless. The documents, we had to go find the attorney, have them, have them print out all the documents and recertify them. So it was an extra task. So by having them on the phone, it saves a problem. So this is something that's coming out real soon and uh, it's called Think Smarts and it'll be on Apple Store and Google Play. Another thing to help you out, we wrote a book several years ago, it was published in 15, called Position for Retirement. Chapter 13 talks about estate planning and some of the documents and it helps, under, helps people understand the document. It also has a section in the back that goes into detail. So it's a good book to, to, good book to read. It can be found on the local author's shelf at the Ames Free Library. If you wanna call ECAT, um, we can get you a physical copy for a $20 donation to ECAT and um, we can also send you a PDF to your email for a $10 donation to ECAT. So we're there to help you find information uh, on uh, to help you protect yourself so that, let's face it, you don't do this every day of the week. We do. Um, you know, if you're a nurse, we want you in the emergency. We want you taking care of people. We, I want you taking care of people. I want to go to the nurse that, that knows what they're doing, that's our doctor or attorney. So it's important to let us do our job and to bring us, invite us into your life and let us build a team as we discussed on the show. The other thing we talked about a little bit was long-term care planning. So important. Um, a lot of attorneys will first, before they even get into the long-term, the estate planning aspect of things, they'll ask for, for a long-term care plan. Um, what is your plan for long-term care? Can you qualify for insurance? Is that something that will benefit you? Um, if you have a lot of qualified assets, which we go through in um, retirement tax planning for retirement, uh, and you have a lot of qualified assets, long-term care insurance becomes an element. Other types of long-term care programs may fit your need and doesn't involve long-term care insurance. So please don't be afraid. I was just with an attorney a little while ago and we were talking about long-term care planning and people are afraid to plan because they're afraid. And I always think they're afraid because they think they're going to be sold long-term care insurance. They're not necessary. That's not necessarily going to happen. So last year, we, we um, when I say we, myself and professor um, and the CPA and the lawyer and a estate planning attorney, Tim Larry, and that you met on, t on our episode, uh, we wrote this uh, study, and it took us a few years to write it, but it's 83 pages, and it goes through three scenarios of what happens to your investment portfolio if you don't have long-term care, a plan, and it goes through what types of plans you could possibly have that would save you and what it takes to plan to get there. So it's important to plan, and I, I know we go through that all the time, and each time you see an episode for Well-Informed, we do one with estate planning, we go heavily into planning. So please plan, and um, we're there to help you out with whatever you need to do. And uh, thank you for your time.
and i hope we're helpful for you and have a great day.